Hey, we're going to jump right in today. Uh, there was a young pastor who was asked to talk uh, on a Sunday morning message about sex. And he was so nervous about it, he had never talked about it before. He was so nervous about it, in fact, that when he went to write his message, he wouldn't even write the word sex out. He would put an S everywhere in his notes that the word sex would be. During the week while he was working on his message, his wife was looking over his shoulder and she saw all these S's scattered out on the page. And she said, what do those S's stand for? And he was so nervous to even tell his wife he was talking about sex on a Sunday morning that he said, sailing, they're, they're, that stands for sailing. And she thought that was kind of odd, but she thought maybe, you know, he had some analogy that he would use in the message. And so that Sunday came, and as it turned out, his wife was sick and wasn't able to come to church that day. And as he warmed up in the message, he did an awesome job. He just did a fantastic job, really laid out this difficult topic really, really well. Well, later on that week, his wife ran into someone from the church. And she said, I just wanted to tell you, your husband did an amazing job Sunday with a very difficult topic, really helped a lot of us out. And the wife said, you know, I'm really surprised but thankful for that because I honestly didn't think my husband would have anything to offer on that topic. <laughs> He's only ever done it twice, and both times he fell overboard. <laughs> well, anyway, today, welcome, welcome, welcome to our continuation in the series, Naked and Not Afraid. Honestly, today, we're really not talking so much about sex today. We're going to get into some of your juicy questions next week. But today, I want to talk about how to love. And this is perfect. It really is a great day for mothers and, and husbands to be here, for moms and dads to be here today. I want to talk about love and how to develop an intimacy that is more in line with the love of God than it is of the love of our world. And this is going to translate, no matter who you are, where you're at in this room, this is going to translate to your relationship with others. This is going to uh, translate to your relationships inside of your marriage. This is going to translate with your relationships of a future spouse if you are single. Now, the message throughout this series that we've been doing a team teaching, and if you've missed this, if you've missed the, uh, the first two weeks of this series, I want to highly encourage you to go back. The first week, kind of Tyler laid this out, and then Caleb built on it, and I'm going to be building further on that. But we were basing this series on this passage of Scripture that's defining marriage from the original design from God. And so if you have your Bibles, I'm going to be reading from Genesis chapter 2, starting with verse 21. It's going to be on the screen. Genesis chapter 2, verse 21. The Scripture says, So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. While he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. I think it was more like, Whoa, man, first time he saw her. For she was taken out of the man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. So the first week, we talked about how God's design for marriage may look very different, you guys, from our culture. And if you think about this, if you look at all the cult cultures in the world and different cultures for thousands of years and the design for marriage created by God, and it has been a challenge for every single generation. It's been a challenge for every single culture and every single time period. And what every single culture throughout history has tried to do is change Scripture or change the meaning to fit the current culture. But that doesn't really do us any good because our goal as Christ followers, our goal as Christ followers is to trust God, to put our trust in God and to trust in His Word. And to know that His ways are better than our ways. And His ways are actually to protect us and to help us live the most fulfilled lives possible. Even if what we read and what we see in His Word and when we trust that, even if it goes against our current 
culture. The Word of God is for our benefit and it's for our fullness of life throughout all of time, regardless of how our culture views something. And so that's the challenge for us. Because oftentimes when we see something in Scripture that flies in the face or is countercultural from the way we live, we oftentimes want to throw up some sort of a barrier to defend our current culture against God's Word. But here's the working definition. Here's the working definition that we've been building on for the design of marriage. That marriage is God-designed. This is a God-designed thing. This was not just a man-made-up thing. This was designed long before the United States was ever a country. Long before that you had to sign on a marriage certificate. Long before it was to protect your civil rights. Long before it was to get your social security or to be able to file jointly as taxes. This was a God-designed covenantal relationship. It was a promise It was a promise that you're making one man and one woman. So that's the definition of marriage. Marriage is a God-designed covenantal relationship between one man and one woman. Now, I understand. I I understand this completely. Um, And I've even lost some sleep over this a little bit this week. That we would have to be completely removed from our culture in order to not feel any tension inside of this definition of marriage. And if you disagree with this statement, I just want you to hear me out and don't check out on me mentally. And what we talked about last week is that this definition, this is the target. This is the target that God has designed marriage for. This was God's original plan for us. But every single one of us in this room has in some way or another fallen short of hitting this perfect target of God's design for marriage. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul talks about men loving their wives in such a way that just as Christ loved the church, even willing to give himself up for the church, we are supposed to live that kind of a sacrificial life and living for our wives in that way and loving that way that we would be willing to give up for her. There have been many times in my marriage, and this week, by the way, this Saturday, we will celebrate 29 years of marriage this year. Yeah. If you know me well, you're really applauding for Michelle there to survive uh, living with me for 29 years. But you know what? There have been so many times that I have fallen short of that ideal target of loving Michelle like Jesus loves Michelle and putting aside my own self um, for her. I've been, I've been prideful. I've thought of myself first before her. I have hurt her and wounded her with my words. I've been selfish and a, and a whole host of other challenges where I've fallen short. So just know that every single one of us falls short in areas of God's design for this very sacred and special relationship. So I want to begin to answer some questions that have come in. And I want to tie that in with this common thread of understanding the love of God in our lives. And so if you're, if you're a guest today, what we've done is is that we have given you uh, an opportunity to ask some questions during this series on marriage, sex, and relationships. And trying to keep the, the questions based around those three areas in marriage, relationships, uh, and, and in sex. And you can text, in fact, you can text um, if you still want to do that. We, you've got until about the end of today or tomorrow. You can text relationships to 43506. Don't do it right now because I don't want you to miss anything with this. But write that down, text it later. And uh, you can even do that anonymously. We've had some really, really good questions come in. And then next week we're going to have a panel discussion uh, with a professional counselor. There will be some other folks on the stage. And we're going to have a a great 30-minute time of answering some of those questions. Let me tell you, some of the questions that have come in are going to be just really good uh, to answer next week. So that's going to be good. But here's a couple of questions that have come in that I I wanted to go ahead and just tackle those today. I wanted to go ahead and grab those because I think it's really, really important. 
There's some multiple questions that have come in around this same topic, and so I've just kind of blended them in into one question, and I'll answer it. Here's the question. I'm a bisexual. Some of the others have said I'm a homosexual. I'm concerned about my Christian path. Some people have said I shouldn't call myself a Christian because of my sexuality. But I feel as connected to the church as anyone else. Does this affect my relationship with the church? And does this affect how God loves me? I need to get a drink here first before I answer that. It's a great question. And before I answer that, can I, can I beg you, as our family of believers here, as our family together, can I beg you to extend some grace on me on how I answer this? Will you give me what we say, will you give me an umbrella of mercy, please? Okay, give me an umbrella of mercy. I know the stakes are high. I know the stakes are high for how I answer. We have always been a church at River Run. If you're new to River Run, we have always been a church of people. We've been made up of people from so many different backgrounds. We have been a church from day one for people who have given up on God, for people who have given up on the church, for people who don't know God but are searching after God, for people also that have had a lifelong, deep-rooted faith relationship. It's been a beautiful expression of all of us coming together at different, at different places in our journey of faith. And one of the things that every single one of us in this room have in common, every single one of us, is that we all have fallen short of the holiness and the righteousness and the goodness of God. I'm a sinner who with all of my heart loves God, and I'm trying my very best to love everyone as in a part of our family like God loves you. I fall short of that all the time, but I want you to know my heart in that. And the answer I'm about to give is for actually every single one of us in this room. If you are gay, if you are straight, if you are transgender, and I don't even know all the different letters these days, if you are addicted, if you are a gossip, if you put money before God, if you worship sports, if you have a problem telling the truth, if you've ever stole anything, this answer is for you. And here we go. No matter what you've done, no matter who you are, no matter how far off the target you are from God's design for relationships, let me say this, God cannot love you any more than he already does. God loves you unconditionally. You can't get enough things right in your life. You can't be good enough. You can't serve enough. You can't be a good enough husband. You can't be a good enough wife, a child, a daughter, an aunt, or an uncle, a parent, or a grandparent that will cause the God of the universe to love you more than he already does. This is the kind of love that God has for you. It's a totally different kind of love than anything else our world understands about love. We have a conditional love in our culture. It's just part of being a part of mankind. We have a conditional love. And this is a different kind of love. It's a completely different kind of love that's an unconditional love. And God cannot love you any more than he already loves you right now. That's number one. Number two is that if you have given your heart and soul and life to Jesus Christ, and you have put your trust in him, you can absolutely call yourself a Christian. Number three, that I will say that no matter where you are in your walk with Christ, no matter how far away from God you have found yourself, no matter how much sin you have committed in your life, you are unequivocally, which means there should be no doubt in your mind that you are welcome here among our family. And among our church, yeah, absolutely. You're absolutely, unequivocally welcome here to journey with us all as we're all trying our best to pursue Christ and to become more like Christ and to share the love of Christ with others. And the fourth thing I would say to you who've asked that question, and then it applies to all of us, is that I'm not trying to change you. 
I'm not trying to change you. That's not my job. That's not our church's job. My job is to live as obedient as I can be to God and who he wants me to become and to introduce you to the one and the only one who through Jesus Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit in your heart and in your mind to become more like him. Only he can do the changing in your heart. Only he can do the changing in my heart and in our minds and in our relationships. And my one mission and my one goal is that I want to, for my life, I'm running hard following after Jesus. And I want you to run hard following after Jesus because of what he has done for us in our lives. And trust him and trust that his ways are better than our ways, even if those seem to go against culture. And even if they go against my own personal thoughts, I want to grow in my love for Christ in a way that my mind begins to be transformed, my heart begins to be transformed. And then I want to share that and introduce other people to Jesus Christ and let him do the changing that needs to happen in our lives. I'm a long way. I'm a long way from reaching that point. And I know every one of us in this room is a long way from reaching that point too. But it's my desire as a follower of Christ. And this has nothing to do with me being a pastor. I could be selling shoes on the side of the road right now. And this would still be my desire as I want to help people know and experience the God of the universe who loves them in in ways that this world doesn't even understand. And even those of us who are Christ followers for a long time can't still begin to know the depths of God's love for us. But the change that happens in your life and in my life only comes from the work of the Holy Spirit. That is God living in us, taking up residence in us. And listen, the closer that we draw, the closer that we draw to the mind of Christ and to the heart of God, the more pliable we become to live closer then to the target for who God is calling us to be, okay? This may be one of the most important lessons we can learn about how we interact with people and especially our spouse. It's not our job to change our spouse. God bless my wife. Michelle and I are, we're like the poster children for how opposites attract. We, we are so opposite. If you know my wife, you know me, you know we are the living embodiment of opposites. You know, I'm an extrovert. She's an introvert. I like sports. She doesn't. You know, I like spicy food. She likes foo-foo. You know, I like camping and she likes, you know, the Ritz-Carlton or whatever one of those places are, you know. I'm the beauty. She's the beast, you know. Okay, the other way around. But you know what? For almost the first half of our marriage, almost the first half of our marriage, I felt like it was my job to change her. I would try to talk her into going camping with us, and she'd go, and she'd be miserable. I would secretly would put habanero peppers in her food, you know. I'd buy, I didn't really do that. I, I would buy her U.K. basketball shirts. I did do that. You know, I was a bit obsessive-compulsive growing up. I'm much better than that now you know I'm cured of that but I would try to get her to clean her car like I cleaned my car this is no joke I tell you the truth one day I brought her out to her car with a handful of q-tips in my hand and tried to get her to dip the q-tips in the armor all like I do to clean all the vents just right you know And you know what she did? She slapped my hand with the Q-tips in there, and she said, if you want to clean the car that way, you can clean that car that way because you're nuts, you know. (laughs) (laughs) Some of our greatest tensions would be me trying to change her. And honestly, you know, we've been married for so long. She was way, way more mature, still is, than I was growing up together. You know, one of the things I always appreciate, she never tried to change me. Uh, But here's the thing I would say. The greatest intimacy, the greatest intimacy that you can have in your marriage, or if you're single, the greatest intimacy that you can have in a budding and growing relationship is for you to lean into God. 
like you have never done before. That you pursue Jesus and that you begin to grow in the heart and the mind of who Christ is and you begin to love God so much that his unconditional love begins to permeate your soul and to come out in your life. And then when you start loving God this way, and when you start loving your spouse or relationship that you're hoping leads to a deeper relationship, then let me tell you, the Holy Spirit begins to do a work in your marriage, and the Holy Spirit begins to do a work in your relationship in such a way that you grow more intimate in the way that God designed you. And when we start loving our spouse, when we start loving others in our church, in our neighborhoods, and in our families, we begin to develop a more intimate and a deeper level of love. One of the challenges that we have is that we only have one word in the English language that describes love, right? We, we use the same word love um, for so many different types of love. We use the word love for everything that we can think of, right? Um, I love my new iPhone. I, I love my new car. I love this pizza. It's making me hungry right now. I love my house. I love, I love you. I love you, Mom, for Mother's Day. I love you, Dad. I love my wife. I love my child. I love God. We use the same, we use the same word. When we use that same word for everything, when we relate the love that we have to our spouse or the love that we have for our mom or the love that we have for God, in the same sentence that we say, I love this pizza, yeah, it just sort of loses its meaning, doesn't it? It sort of cheapens it or it at least confuses it with the deepest meaning. I love the Greeks. The, the Greeks... Uh, have multiple words for different types of love. They actually use eight different words for different kinds of love. And I want to tell you about three of the most common words used in different places in Scripture uh, for love. These three different types of love. One is philia or philia. Anybody here, by any chance, anybody here from Philadelphia? Anybody? Yeah. A couple of people from Philadelphia. You know, what does that mean? The city of brotherly love. It comes from this word, philia. It means a brotherly love. This is a brotherly and a sisterly love. And so in Scripture, when it talks about this, this kind of a love, it's a love that we should have for each other, that you and I, we should have this kind of a brotherly love. I mean, it's like, like that kind of love that you have with your siblings. It should be this kind of love that we have as a church family for our neighbors. Everyone, we truly, I mean, truly have this brotherly type love. And before we can enter into a sexual relationship inside the covenant of marriage, right, it must start with this kind of love. Now, that's been confusing in our culture these days because we have people in hookup sites that will put sexual uh, relationships before they even have a relationship of brotherly love, right? Right? We see that all the time with these apps like Tinder and whatever else. There are probably a bunch of them now, you know. But we see that all the time. But you have to have this philia, this brotherly type of love. And before you ever enter into a sexual relationship, you've got to have, you've got to develop this type of love based around the love of the Father, the love of God. The second word they use, though, is, for, is reserved for marriage intimacy, and that's eros. It's where we get the word erotic from. This is the sexual and intimate type of love between a husband and a wife. This is part of that covenant promised love in God's design for sex between a man and a woman who have made a promise to each other and to God. And we're going to talk about, next week we're going to talk about the challenges of what happens when, when we live outside of that promise and that covenant. And then we're going to talk about the healing that can take place in your life um, for those of us who have lived outside of that design of marriage. We're going to talk about the healing of that. But then there's this, there's this ultimate expression of love, which is kind of what I've been working us towards today. 
The third word that they use for love is the purest, the most highest form of love, and that's called agape love. This is the highest, most radical type of love, according to the Greeks. This is a selfless, unconditional love. Only God can actually fully love to this extent perfectly. But it should be our target. It should be our desire for you and I, every one of us, to grow in this type of unconditional agape love. This is the type of love that I was talking about at the beginning of this talk. And agape love is this unconditional love. It's the purest form of love that is free from desires and expectations. It loves regardless of the flaws and shortcomings of others. And today, as I wrap this up, we're going to move into a time of reflection on God's Word and a time of communion where we join together at communion. And we see this kind of selfless love expressed, this agape love. We see this expressed by Jesus on the cross for being the ultimate sacrifice. So that no matter who we are, how far we've traveled away, how far we've drifted away from God and the design that God had for us to worship Him and come to Him and live a life of obedience and live a life of faithfulness, and that none are perfect, He came and was the ultimate sacrifice on the cross for us. His blood poured over and covered over our sins. And because of what He took on for the cross, that's what drives us to want to live faithfully. That's what drives us to want to trust his word. That's what drives us to want to be obedient and faithful to God. Not that we're earning our way to heaven, but because we want to honor the sacrifice of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. And if you've never put your hope and trust in Jesus, I would invite you. I would invite you to do that. So what we're going to do is we'll move into this time of reflection. If you're, a, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, we invite you to come to the tables. We'll have two tables in the front, two tables in the back. You can take the bread that represents the body of Christ. And you can take the juice, the grape juice that represents the blood that was poured out for you. There are little trash cans off to the side here. You can dispose of your cups there in the trash cans off to the side. For others of you, I'm going to invite our prayer partners to come over here to the front. We'd love to invite you to come for prayer. We'd love to pray with you. For others of you, you may want to just sit right where you're at. But I encourage you to spend this time, bow your head, reflect on God's word. Spend some time asking God to do some work in your heart, in your mind, in your soul. Would you stand with me? Let's pray. Father, there's some... Some challenging words today because they go against so much of what our culture sees and hears and talks about. But God, we've all fallen so short in so many areas. And I just thank you for your grace. Um, I don't even deserve it in my life. And even the words thank you, I wish there was a stronger word that just says thank you for what you've done for us on the cross. I thank you for our church family here and the grace that we extend each other and the mercy that we have as we're all pursuing you, God. And so we come to this table and we come to this time, we come for this time of prayer and we just ask you to do, do your work that only you can do in our hearts and in our minds, God. For any areas I've spoken uh, wrongly, God, I just pray that you would wipe that from the minds of people and do that own work in my own heart, God. But for the areas where your word comes out, truth, God, I pray that we would just uh, digest that, that we would wrestle with it, and that we, our heart's desire, God, would just be to continue to pursue you and become more like you in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.